Hi, this is Joe Montana. This is Dak Prescott. Hey, this is Jason Kelsey, and you're listening to Rob Motti. Rob Motti. Rob Motti. I am Rob Motti, and welcome to the AP Pro Football Podcast. The Steelers finally lost their first game after an 11-0 start. COVID schedule changes disrupted their flow. The playoff picture's tightening up. We'll be talking about that and much more, including a look ahead to some of the big, important matchups this weekend. Philadelphia Eagles rookie receiver Jalen Rieger is coming up on the show Jalen has fought through injuries this season, but he's got an excellent perspective on it. So look forward to sharing that conversation with you. He also has a great cause that he's supporting for the NFL's My Cause, My Cleats campaign. And of course, my colleague Barry Wilner, AP Pro Football writer and Pro Football Hall of Fame voter. He will join me for our weekly look around the league. The biggest news in the NFL this week was personal because I get to cover this on a daily basis and it was the benching of Carson Wentz. Eagles coach Doug Peterson pulled him out of the 30-16 loss to Green Bay, and now he's going to turn it over to rookie Jalen Hurts this Sunday against the 10-2 New Orleans Saints, who happen to have the NFL's number one ranked defense. So that's going to be a difficult challenge for Jalen Hurts as he makes his first career start. The Eagles are 3-8-1, and and they're now playing for a top five pick In the 2021 draft, they're currently sixth behind Dallas, and there's a scenario that this weekend they can move into the number four spot with a loss and if the L.A. Chargers win. Now, Carson Wentz finished third in NFL MVP voting in just his second season in 2017. He tore two knee ligaments in week 14 that year, and he had to watch Nick Foles lead the Eagles to the franchise's only Super Bowl title. He came back in 2018, Started the season late, had a higher passer rating than he did in 2017, 102.2, and finished that season with a back injury that forced him to watch Nick Foles lead the Eagles to the playoffs and a win in Chicago. He was playing at a high level last December when he led a group of, they had a a practice squad on offense to four straight must wins. They won the NFC East. Carson Wentz became the first quarterback in NFL history to throw for 4,000 yards without one receiver having 500 yards. And now suddenly, a year later, he goes from being a top 10 quarterback to the bench. So the big question around the league in Philly is, what happened? And it's easy to point the blame at the quarterback because they make the most money, they're the face of the franchise, and quite frankly, when we do that, it's the simple lazy thing to do. Because if you dig deeper beyond surface level analysis, there are actual explanations and valid reasons why a 27-year-old talented player who should be in the prime of his career is having the worst season of his NFL career. And start with this, an offensive line that's been a revolving door, depleted by injuries, 11 different line combinations in 12 games. They're missing two of the best in the business. Right guard Brandon Brooks, right tackle Lane Johnson. They're out. Brooks hasn't played all season long. Lane Johnson is one of the most valuable players on the team. Just look at their record with him and their record without him since he's been in Philly. And it's hard to throw when you're a quarterback, when you're any quarterback, when you're constantly under pressure. Wentz has been sacked 50 times. 50 times this year. Does he hold the ball too long sometimes? Yes, of course he does. Jalen Hurts, he's far more mobile. He was sacked three times on just four drives last week. Now, they've had injuries to Deshaun Jackson, injuries to Alshon Jeffrey, injuries to Jalen Rieger, and that's forced Carson Wentz to throw to young and inexperienced receivers. You have defenses who are playing bump and run coverage. There's been some timing issues. They disrupt them coming off the ball. There's been a ton of growing pains. And then you have to look at this, the offensive system. The system that Carson Wentz is playing in is not fitting his strengths. Their play action doesn't work, so he's often he's dropping back. The defense knows he's going to pass. He's got nowhere to go with the ball, and he's trying to survive in a collapsing pocket. He's best on the move. We've seen that, but the designed rollouts are few and far between. There's not a lot of misdirection plays. The screen game is non-existent. The run game is inconsistent, and all of that has led to this point where Carson Wentz is going to the bench for Jalen Hurts. It's a full-blown-out quarterback controversy that seemed inevitable from the moment the Eagles spent a second-round pick on the Heisman Trophy runner-up when they had far more pressing needs. And GM Howie Roseman said, well, we're trying to build a quarterback 
factory. Jalen Hurts has talent. He might end up being a starter in this league, but the Philadelphia Eagles created a mess of a situation, and now they got to figure out what to do with Carson Wentz as a $128 million four-year contract extension that he signed in 2019 kicks in next year. This is an incredible dilemma, and I have the privilege of covering it on a daily basis. Joining me now for our weekly conversation to go around the league is our longtime AP Pro Football writer, Barry Wilner. Barry, the NFC East had a pair of huge upset wins on the road. You saw Washington in Pittsburgh's bid for an unbeaten season. Now, the Steelers, we talked about this last week, they're playing on four days rest against a team that was off for 10 days, and Washington now has won three in a row. Giants, they went to Seattle. They knocked off the Seahawks. They're trying to become the first team in the Super Bowl era to make the playoffs after an 0-5 start. So you got both teams now at 5-7. and seven. I still don't think you're going to see a winning record in the NFC East, but there's an outside chance one of these two teams might get to 8-8. Eight and eight. How much credit do you give both of those first-year coaches, Joe Judge in New York, who's a first-year coach altogether, and then Ron Rivera, first year in Washington? How much credit, Barry, do you give them for the in-season turnarounds that we're seeing with both of these teams? Uh, the coaches get tremendous credit. The, their entire staff get tremendous credit because they're talking about two teams that really had uh, sunk toward the bottom of the league. Certainly Washington had the second pick in the draft. And uh, it, there's also the matter of not just changing the roster around, but changing the culture of the teams. And I think that's clearly happened with Ron Rivera in Washington. Uh, I do agree with you that um, a winning record is probably out of uh, their reach. But 8-8 uh, eight and eight could happen for uh, either of these teams. They are playing pretty well. It's not a fluke that each of them uh, have gotten somewhat hot. And th- there are enough potential wins against teams that are not playing all that well on their schedule that maybe they could get to 8-8. Eight and eight. Give them credit, obviously, for the in-season turnarounds and changing the culture. Now, you look around the league, and you got Stefanski in Cleveland with what the Browns are doing, and neither one of us liked them going against the Titans last week. We were both wrong. What what they did, you know, what did they prove to you with that big road win? And you got to put Stefanski in the mix for Coach of the Year. You got to put Brian Flores in the mix for Coach of the Year. Uh, both of those guys changing cultures, just like Joe Judge did and Ron Rivera. Absolutely. The, the Browns really surprised me in that game. I, I think the Titans surprised me, too, that they were so bad in the first half. But a lot of that had to do with how the Browns were playing. Um, I really thought that Cleveland was a bogus team, but I, I have to change my mind on that. Uh, clearly, the Browns should be in the playoffs. I don't know that they'll be real dangerous in the playoffs, but these are the Browns. They have the longest streak of not making the playoffs. And what Stefanski has done there, again, changing the culture – getting this team to believe, getting the locker room in order, which is really a a difficult thing to do when you've had losing going on for so long. Those are two uh, two or three of the things that Rivera has done in Washington, that Judge has done in New York, that Stefanski has done uh, in Cleveland. And I'll add a fourth guy of the five who were hired uh, this uh, season, Matt Rule has done a nice job in Carolina, which also had a scandal, just like the Redskins, uh, former Redskins have had. And um, Matt Rule has had that team playing hard, despite not having its best player, it's probably its best two players for much of the season in McCaffrey and Kawan Short. Uh, so I think that's a fourth place that we've seen that the coaching change uh, really bodes well for the future. And in Miami, we saw towards the end of last year, I, I liked what Flores was doing, changing that culture, building that team, and, and now they're in a position to challenge for the playoffs. This year, I thought they're going to be a year away. I didn't expect them to be in contention for a playoff spot this year, certainly not at 8-4. and four. Uh, Do they surprise you a little bit? Are they further along than you thought they would be in 2020? Yeah, they are further along, Rob. Uh, I thought they had an outside chance at 8-8, eight 9-7. Eight, uh, I didn't know if that would be good enough for the playoffs. I actually expected the Patriots to be a little bit better than they've been. Um, 
and uh, might be the second best team in that division. They still might be. Who knows? But uh, I do like what I've seen from uh, Miami. You know, Flores is that rare former assistant coach for Belichick who is actually had success elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would also say that uh, another coach we should mention in the mix uh, for the top coaching job this year is uh, Sean McDermott in Buffalo. Um, I thought Buffalo would contend for that division crown, but I didn't think Buffalo would be almost a powerhouse. And that's what the Bills have looked like at times this year. So we've seen several turnarounds. The Vikings are 5-1 and one after a 1-5 and five start. They got a tough matchup this week in Tampa, and we'll get to that later. But they're right back in the playoff picture. They're currently holding that final wild card spot, tied with the Cardinals, who are going to play the Giants this week and then the Eagles next week. So two things. One, which of those teams do you like for that last wild card berth in the NFC, or do you like someone else? And I kind of feel like you're not as sold on the Vikings' turnaround as their record might indicate. I'm not sold at all on the Vikings. No, I... Uh, they may make the playoffs. Uh, between them and, and the Cardinals, I think maybe I'd lean toward uh, Minnesota, which is also you know in a much easier division, which has to help. But um, I see things from the Vikings that really disturb me. They, they played so poorly against the Cowboys, who are one of the three or four worst teams in the league right now. Um, they did not play well against the Jaguars and, and had to pull out a game that in many ways the Jaguars blew. So, I mean, I think that there's more talent in Minnesota than we're seeing. I really worry about that defense. I'm not uh, uh, sold at all on their pass rush nor on their secondary. So I I think the Vikings, even if they make the playoffs, uh, I think they're kind of an easy out in the first round. The Jets lost the game, Barry, to go to 0-12, and and it it looked like they almost threw it at the end, except for the fact that (laughs) defensive coordinator Greg Williams got fired a day later after he blitzed Derek Carr with five seconds left. An all-out blitz with five seconds left, and Carr throws that touchdown pass to Henry Ruggs, 46 yards. Vegas gets the win. Now, apparently, though, that's how Greg Williams has defended the desperation heaves, the Hail Mary throws in the past. He likes to send an all-out blitz. One, it's better for the Jets to have lost that game as they're competing for the number one pick in, in the draft and the rights to Trevor Lawrence, but... What's going on there? Why do you fire the coordinator the next day? I think that um, they don't want to fire the head coach until the season's over, and they felt they had to make a move because of the uproar in New York. And, Rob, you know, you're from Philly. You know what it's like mm. when uh, <laughs> things go wrong for teams and, and the uproar that you see amongst fans and the media. So uh, that's part of it. Uh, the Jets deserve 0-16. Uh, I hate to say that. I have a family filled with Jets fans. But they have just made so many bad decisions and so many uh, instances on and off the field. Uh, the culture there, as we've talked about before, is rotten. Uh, you've got their best players asking out and then are uh, accommodated. Uh, it's just a really terrible situation. And, uh, you know, it goes right, right up to the ownership, really. Um, they, if they get the number one pick, and it's hard to believe they won't, It'll be very interesting to see if Trevor Lawrence decides that Clemson's a real nice place to stay for another year. (laughs) Barry, we're one week closer to getting through the regular season as scheduled. The NFL had to survive a outbreak with the Ravens and juggle around the schedule and all kinds of stuff going on. Are you more encouraged right now that we're we're going to be able maybe to get through this season on time now that we're heading down the home stretch, four games left? Uh, I would say encouraged, yes. I would not say optimistic, yes, mm. because of what we saw recently, and especially the, all the jumbling for Thanksgiving week and the following week. So I still think that a week 18 may be in play, uh, specifically as we get toward the last two or three weeks of the season if we see another outbreak where there's just no way to squeeze in uh, the games that might have to be postponed. As we head down this final stretch, let's take a look at some of the big matchups this weekend. Several important games, and I'm going to start with the Chiefs, who are 11-1, and one, and now with Pittsburgh's loss, they're fighting for that one seed. They're right there. They can see it. They can smell it. They can get that by, and they're visiting Miami, who's 8-4, and four, as we talked about a little bit earlier. The Dolphins are seven-point home underdogs, as well they should be against Kansas City. 
Here's a stat for you. Patrick Mahomes has played 11 games in 70 degrees or warmer weather. 37 touchdowns, one pick, 10 and one straight up, eight and three against the spread. I mentioned, you know, Brian Flores, what he did last year and what he's building in Miami. I thought they're a year away. I don't think they're going to have the firepower offensively to match up with Kansas City. I like the Chiefs in this one. Who do you like? I love that warm weather stat. Crazy. Uh, I, I like I like the Chiefs, Rob, and I, I think they will cover the spread. And I also think that the Chiefs have been a bit up and down. Uh, they didn't play great against Denver. Uh, they only seem to be cruising through that game at times, and I've seen it in other times. I think they go down to Miami and they get things really in order. Um, they have some pretty good memories about being in Miami, I would think. And uh, I think they win that game by uh, a couple of touchdowns. Here's a tough one, too. Steelers are a a two-and-a-half-point underdog in Buffalo against the 9-3 and Bills, and it's going to be on Sunday Night Football, which they haven't had in Buffalo for several years. It's a very interesting game. The Bills' only loss in the last six weeks, last six games, was that Hail Mary game to Arizona. I think the Steelers bounce back from this loss. They can move the ball. Buffalo's defense, 21st ranked. Maybe that loss to Washington was somewhat of a wake-up call. Now they're in a fight for the bye. Here's an, here's an interesting stat for you. Josh Allen, though, this season undefeated in games in which he's been sacked multiple times. He's 5-0 and in games where he's been sacked more than once, and he's 4-3 and when he's been sacked uh, zero or one time. I believe that streak's going to end this week. I like the Steelers, even though they're on the road. Who do you like? I think the Steelers are ready for a bounce back, but they need to get more balance on the offense, they really miss James Conner because they seem to have lost confidence in the other running backs. And, you know, we're seeing uh, Ben Roethlisberger throw the ball so much, and that's just not the Steelers. Uh, they're also missing two starting linebackers who are both very good players and are out for the season. Having said that, I, I think this is a good matchup for them. Uh, I, I actually think that the Steelers tend to play better on the road than they do at home. And uh, I, I like the Steelers to win this game. I will say this, though. Uh, should the Bills win, and particularly should the Bills win uh, decisively, then we have to really consider them uh, a prime contender uh, for the AFC Championship. Yeah, I'm not ready to go there yet with the Bills. I need to see it, and if they can do it this week, you're right. Yeah, you put them in that spot. Uh, the Buccaneers are coming off a bye. They've lost two straight games. They've lost three of four. They got the Vikings visiting. They're six-and-a-half-point favorites at home. I don't know how to figure this team out anymore. I, they could blow Minnesota out, or they can scratch out a win. Uh, I think they're going to win the game, but I don't know which way it's going to go, so I don't like it from a betting standpoint. What do you expect? I think that the main matchup here is uh, the receivers for Tampa Bay against a very weak secondary that has played a little bit better, but not that much better for Minnesota in the last few weeks. I think that's where the game will be decided. I expect Tom Brady to throw for a few touchdowns in this game, so I kind of like Tampa Bay, but it's another one of those games, like you said, I don't think I'd put any money on a game like that. All right, Barry, as always, man, good stuff, and we'll talk again next week. You bet, Rob. Thanks. Jalen Rieger was selected by the Eagles with the 21st pick in the first round of this year's NFL draft. His dad, Monte Rieger, played nine seasons in the NFL with Denver, Indianapolis, and his last season, he played in Philly in 2007. I sat down with Jalen this week to chat about his season, growing up in an NFL family, and his support for mental wellness through the NFL's My Cause, My Cleats campaign, and much more. Here's my conversation with Philadelphia Eagles rookie Jalen Rieger. Jalen, you scored on a 73-yard punt return against the Packers. It helped the team get within seven points. You guys still didn't get the win, but that had to be a great feeling in that moment. As you're going through it and you're racing to the end zone, what was going through your mind? Well, from the time I stepped back, you know, it was, I, I was like, you know, I had to make And, uh, you know, I just want to show everyone, show, you know, special teams coordinator. Um, you know, the team just show them, you know, why I'm here. And, uh, you know, running in, I, I knew – you know, just don't let the don't let the punt attack you. So my, my my whole mind was set up to score. There were uh, high expectations for you, man, coming into this season. There was a lot of pressure being a first round pick, and especially in a city like Philly, you had to deal with so many different injuries so far. 
You guys didn't have an off season. How would you describe how this season has gone for you? It's, it's like, you know, I just got into a little adversity. That's it, really. Because, uh, you know, I had messed up my shoulder, then I messed up my thumb and uh, kind of set me back. But I look at it as like, you know, it's just a challenge. It's just another challenge, another stepping stone and uh, just to climb the mountain every day. What has been, what would you say has been the toughest transition when you go from college to the pros? You have to know them 100% because everybody at this level is, is great, you know, so you have great corners and great, you know, just people that they've seen it before. And me being a, a first year player, a lot of things that I may do, they've seen a million times. So you have to give respect to everybody and study your opponent and kind of hone your craft. How much does it help you, Jalen, having a dad who played in the NFL, he even finished his career in Philly? How much do you get to lead on him a little bit and talk to him about his experiences? Um, I talk to him all the time about it. I mean, just having him, it, it kind of, I wouldn't even say prepared because, uh, you know, him and my mother, you know, they, they kind of instilled in me, you just got to keep going. You can't get down. You can't, you know, let things affect you. And uh, having, having my dad and mom on my side and especially, you know, my dad playing here, you know, he just, he, he and not even just playing in Philly, just playing in the league in general. He's uh, prepared me for this role. What did he tell you about Eagles fans? They're passionate. They got a lot of energy. They can love you one minute and they can get on you hard. What did he tell you about the Eagles fans? He he just mentioned them. He didn't make a, I mean, my family, one thing I can say, we don't make big, we don't make big, like big deals out of things like that because those are things you can't control. And we're all about controlling the controllables. What memories do you have of him playing in the league? Do you, do you recall, I mean, you were young, obviously, when he won a Super Bowl with the Colts. Do you remember any of that? Were you around the team at all? What was what was that like for you? Yeah, with the Colts, I was always in the locker room, uh, especially uh, when they won the Super Bowl. I remember him. Uh, when the clock hit zero, he came to the stands and got me, brought me on the field as uh, when they, you know, got had the ceremony for the Super Bowl. And it was, it was, it was a great experience. Um, I was about seven years old. And uh, it was just good to be around, you know, the team and see what it takes to, you know, win a championship. Well, your wide receivers coach here in the NFL, Aaron Moore, had played with him on the Colts and they had a relationship. Do you guys talk a little bit about that? And, and how much does it help having somebody who, you know, knew your dad and, and was part of the league, too, as well? Um, it's, it's a it's a it, it's a big factor. I mean, because Coach Moorhead, he recruited me uh, in high school as well when he was coaching at A&M. And, uh, I went to the camp and I've been knowing him for a minute. So just having that relationship with him, you know, and, and, and extending on to my father, it just, it, it keeps me comfortable. And, you know, I know, you know, I have someone to go to and, you know, he knows what it takes. He, he, he was on that team and he played receiver as well. You got a lot of confidence. I've seen that in you from the first time we had an opportunity to talk to you on draft day all the way through now. You got a lot of confidence, which I think you really obviously need at the position that you play. Where does that come from? Uh, it's, it comes from within. Um, I, I'm, I'm one guy. You, that's one thing you'll never have to worry about. You know, trying to coach on me or even say to me. You know, because confidence is me. And uh, if you, I mean, why, why wouldn't I be confident? I play, for, I play in the NFL, regardless of how it goes, regardless of trials and tribulations. I mean, I'm in the NFL. You know, I'm one of the, I'm one of the one percent. So, I, I, I should have confidence. And you need it, man. You absolutely need it at that position. I talked to Brandon Marshall a couple of weeks ago, and he just talked about that mentality, man, of being a wide receiver, being in that position, wanting the ball, being that guy. And I can sense that you have that, and that's going to help you as your career progresses. Jalen, I want to talk to you a little bit about the My Cause, My Cleats campaign, because you chose to support Black Men Heal. And I love their motto, heal men, heal men. Why is this cause important to you? Um, just, you know, like, like my whole gist is, is mental health because I, I've heard, I heard a saying, you know, you can, you can, those who've been cut can bleed on others, you know, that's trying to, you know, I would say come into their life. And like, you, like their motto says, healed men, healed men. I mean, people, people who went through it and, and asked questions and got, and have gotten help, they can heal those who are, may be afraid or may run from help. But once they, once they get their help or they seek help, they can be healed as well. I just mentioned Brandon Marshall. Talked to him a couple of weeks ago. He went through certain issues uh, and he tackled them head on. I've spoken to Brian Dawkins. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to meet him yet. Obviously an Eagles legend, a Hall of Famer. And both of those players, former players, stressed to me the importance of breaking that stigma, Jalen, that it's okay 
to not be okay and to go out and seek the help. What Absolutely. would you say? You know, what would you say to anybody going through these issues who might be a little bit reluctant? I mean, the, the same thing. It's okay to not be okay. I mean, you don't have to. That's what people don't know, man. That's like, you know, I watch I watch Brandon Marshall's uh, podcast all the time. I'm athlete and. It's okay to not be okay, like you said. Like you, you can you can ask for help. You don't have to be this superhero, or this Superman. You know that everybody thinks you, thinks you are on the field. It's okay to to be help to ask for help, and then it's okay to be help. It's okay to seek help, and then for anyone that's just out there, you know, in the world that needs help, it's okay to, you know, ask someone, ask questions, talk to family members, talk to friends, talk to close ones. Like it's okay. You don't have to because the worst thing you can do is hold everything in, and then at that point you're just like a volcano. And when something happens, you're going to erupt. So it's like, I look at it as like, if, if you're not asking for help, you're only doing yourself a disservice. That's a great point. How important is it for young people, right? Because you want to nip it in the bud, right? If you start to feel something, if you're going through something, whether it's it's at home, whether it's in school, whether wherever it is, how important is it for young people to get ahead of it, Jalen? I would say it's it's very important because if you if you look at things, you don't you don't want to you don't want to plateau off. And Getting ahead, but like that's basically like you know when you start having problems, you need to seek help. Then don't wait until it it builds up and builds up and builds up, and then you know you have a lot of weight on your shoulders. Because I can use myself as an example. If I was to do that, I already have a lot on my plate. And if I come, you know, let outside things get on my shoulders and not you know seek help, I mean it's only gonna make it worse. What do you do when when you need to chat with somebody, when you need to talk to somebody? Who who do you go to? Who do you turn my, to? Is it your inner circle? Is it your family? What do you do? Uh, my close friends and my and my mother and dad. Like that's that's it. Like I know my 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 close friends. They really they really understand me. We understand each other. And my family, my family, and and to single out my mother and my dad. Like nobody knows me better than them. So they know when something is going wrong. They know when you know, not to say certain things to me or when I don't want to hear certain things, but they know how to get to me. Like they know how to get it out of me. And those are the, those are my circles I go to. Like, you know, it's, and it, it makes it easier for me because I'm not afraid to, like, I'm a very honest man. Like, you know, I'm honest with myself and, you know, that comes with, for example, like, you know, things I can do better on the field or things I can do better off the field. Like I'm an honest man. Like, I don't think I'm the greatest. I don't think any of that. Like, I know I have constant room for improvement and that's what everybody needs to live by. Like, you know, it's okay to ask questions and, and be inquisitive. It's okay because you don't ne- know everything and you never will. So, you know, my inner circle is very close and and, and that's who I go to, you know, when I have problems. And uh, as far as like mental wise, you know, I don't really have that problem because I'm a very confident, strong minded guy. So I'm one of those guys, you know, I look to help. And when I mean help, I don't mean to reach down and help. I mean to assist because that's the problem with people want help. They think that they're beneath the person that's trying to help them. Yeah, not at all. I like how you said that. It's not reaching down. It's reaching out, right? It's reaching Absolutely. out to help people. And I think it's important when you got the right mental frame of mind and you got that right. inner circle to maybe seek out people who you may think maybe you see a teammate who's going through a struggle. Maybe you see a friend who's going through a struggle. Is it, is it hard to sometimes just be upfront with them? Like, how do you, you know, do you look for a little window, a little crack to say, Hey man, you want to talk to somebody? What do you do? I look at it like this. Like I said earlier, see, I'm the type of guy I believe in telling you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Because if I tell you what you want to hear, I'm doing you a disservice. And, and doing that, I'm hurting you. Like I'm not helping you. So if anything, me extending my hand out to you, I'm, I'm really not helping you. All I'm doing is adding on to it because if I'm telling you, oh, it's going to be okay, when it's literally not going to be okay, I'm not helping you. You mentioned a little bit ago, you're an honest guy. There's things that you want to do better on the field without giving away too much of that because, you know, I don't want no DBs listening to this and going, <laughs> hey, this is what Jalen's working on. What do you think you need to, to work on? What do you think you need to get on? Obviously, you missed a lot of time, and, and I think this is still – a growing experience, maturation, getting chemistry with the QBs. What do you think you need to do? Uh, man, I would just say just hone my craft as a whole. Just be more consistent, uh, do things better, be smarter, study more, everything. I mean, I that's 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 the whole that's the beauty of of, of this position and playing this game. You can you can always get better. And I'm not afraid to get better. Like I I don't you know, it's it, it's a lot of talk going on and everything. Like I don't watch other people's journey. What's meant to be will be like, you know, 
I've been going through this kind of underdog type type deal since I was in high school. People didn't think I would be highly recruited. I had crazy offers. People didn't think I would I would do good in college. I did that. People didn't think I would go first round. I did that. People, like so, I, I I'm kind of this guy. Like I I don't really too much worry about you know right now. It's about longevity. It's not how you start. It's how you finish. And uh, you know. As you may have heard, you know, Nipsey Hussle always says it's a marathon, not a sprint. So <laughs> that's how I look at things. Yeah, a lot of players will talk about like having that chip on their shoulder, right? Getting that right. motivation. Uh, how real is that? How, how motivating is that when people, you know, when, when people look at you and, and may doubt you, may may critique you? Is that real? Is that something that you can carry over? Um, it can, but personally, if you're being if you if you need that type of stuff to motivate you, you in it for the wrong reason. Mm. So it could be because because it could be a byproduct. It could be like okay, that that adds a little more fuel to fuel to the fire. But if that's your sole motivation, you're doing it for the wrong reason. And that's coming from me. You know, I have you know everybody's entitled to their own opinion. You can say whatever you want about me. You can say I'm not this. I'm not that. He's better. We should have had him. So what? I mean, it is what it is. Like I, you know, this is my life, not yours. So how I look at it, if you're motivated by that, you're doing it for the wrong reason. I wish you a, a ton of blessings throughout your NFL journey. And I'll probably catch you on a Zoom call next time the Eagles got you on and down at the facility. Oh, no problem. Anytime. Appreciate you. Time for some final thoughts. Des Bryant had a tough night when he was pulled off the field during warmups before the Ravens played Dallas on Tuesday night. He was held out of the game because he tested positive for COVID-19. Obviously, he wanted to face his former team. I cringed seeing Des tweet his raw emotions, saying he was quitting for the season and then taking it back, and then the real time reaction to what really was an emotional roller coaster and how that played out during the broadcast and on social media. Coaches and players, they have a post game cool down period before they talk to the media. I think we all need a cool down period in life before we send out any post on social media. That's it for this week's AP Pro Football Podcast. Thank you to Eagles wide receiver Jalen Rieger and Barry Wilner. Please take a minute to subscribe to the show on iTunes and wherever you get your podcasts. Share, leave a review, tell a friend. And also, check out our college football writer, Ralph Russo, and his AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. Until next week, I'm Rob Motti reminding you, make a difference, be a blessing.